what you learn, what you see, what you experience, I fully pray, expect, hope it will help you to grow your faith. I would want you to come back to the trip and to have deepened your walk with Christ, to look at your faith in a more powerful way than ever before. You know, just a few years ago we went and did this trip to on the Reformation trip in which we went and saw all of Luther's birthplace and, and where he made all of his famous statements and, and then went over to England and saw King Henry and how he began the English Reformation and then all over went John Wesley. I, I can tell you when I came back from that trip, I looked at Martin Luther and the understanding of the Protestant Reformation and understanding of King Henry and the Church of England. And then John Wesley, what he called us to be his Methodists, in a, in a deeper and different way. That's what I hope happens as we go on this trip. We really are going to be learning so much about the history of the church. And as I, you may remember me saying this in some of our smaller gatherings, we are doing this trip the Catholic way. Uh, I know I had a couple of Catholics. Where were my Catholics? They're right back here. <laughs> we're going the Catholic way. Uh, when we met with EO, people who put this together, we were talking that you could do it a couple different ways. You started over Amberdown and you worked your way down to Rome. That's what the Protestants always do. And then the Catholic trips that they run for all the Catholic trips, they always start in Rome and run their way up over Amberdown. And I said, well, I want to start over in, in Rome and work my way to over Amberdown. They said, it's the Catholic way. <laughs> so that's what we're that's what we're doing. That's the trip you're on. Um, but we wanted, you know, gosh, I talked about this. That we wanted this to be where you really think about the history of the church, and you're going to be growing with the church because we wanted to start in Rome, and we'll be learning all about the early history of the church, and then we're going to move up to Assisi because a lot happens in the church from time of Jesus to 1,000 or 1,100, and some great and some not so great. And we're going to talk about it all. We're not going to whitewash anything to make it like, oh, the church and the popes were always perfect. They weren't. We're talking about humans. <coughs> We've been had people piping in all the way from Zidane, Belize, Costa Rica. It is, <laughs> we miss you. We miss you, Paul. <laughs> So, so you can't see it. We have one of our wonderful, faithful members. This is the furthest satellite we have. It's down in Costa Rica. Absolutely. Paul is the only member there, but we still count him there now as a part of, this, as part of our satellite. It's 82 degrees on the beach right now. So, <laughs> so our reach is far and wide as we get to do all of this. Um, so anyway, we're going to go up to Assisi, which I am really excited about. And again, the whole idea will have kind of followed from the birth of the church all the way now up to St. Francis, who really brought a great impact on the life of the church. And it needed to be brought at that time in history. So we're going to talk about that. What did that mean from a spiritual basis in Francis? But then we'll go to Florence and Venice. We'll start seeing what happens with the Renaissance. We're moving out of the Dark Ages. And something wonderful starts happening in the church as well. It's going to be in the 1400s, the 1500s, 1600s. We'll, we'll learn about the Medici and, and all that's going to happen. Then we're going to actually get to go by St. Luke's, where he is buried. We think. So it'll be kind of cool to go by there. Anyway, we will be taking a group picture there. I mean, that's going to be historical. <laughs> we will come back and that will be put in the archives. Here are the St. Luke's family of faith at St. Luke's. I mean, that's, I, I actually think that's pretty cool. We asked for that specifically. It's not on the typical tour. But, uh, wait, this is St. Luke's. Yes, we're going to stop. We're gonna stop there. We're going to do this. And, and then we said, yeah, so that's going to be our 14, 1500s. Go up to over Amargow and in there because now that's going to be the 1600s, the play. And again, how did that have such an impact on the history of the world and the church? But again, I hope by then our faith has kind of been moving on along. To what were they experiencing that day? So I, I want us to be on a pilgrimage that truly goes through history. I hope you get a better feel for the history of the church, the history of your faith, and to see how faith has grown, how 
what develops in, through the history of hundreds and hundreds of years. Our faith should be always growing. It should be always developing. It's never a static thing. And you're going to see how our understanding of Christ, what it means to be a Christian, has continued to change through the years. So that's why we decided to start at Rome and move to Ober Ammergau. Just a, just a quick thought tonight, my small part of this, of where we really are. Um, to remember that the early church, you know, sometimes we think the church has always been the same. And I want you to get an understanding it's not. Jesus comes, Jesus lives, he gathers 12 disciples, he gathers others around him, and Jesus is crucified. He ascends into heaven. What's the one thing he leaves behind that's different in the world from before when he came? It becomes a church. A group of followers who come together who believe they've experienced the manifestation, the incarnation, the revelation, the best revelation ever of God. And they are the ones who come together. So the church, which starts very small now, is going to exist. It's the one thing Jesus left behind. The world was different. Well, it'd be kind of easy. In the beginning, if you wanted to join the church, I'd say, Michael, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? I do so believe. Give me the handshake, secret handshake. Okay. You know, you're, you're, now in, you're now in the church. That's all we need to ask you believe Jesus is Lord? A hundred years later, I'd be saying, Michael, do you? I have a little book here. I want to make sure I had it exactly right. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? The answer is I do so believe. <laughs> I'll let you in if you don't get it right here. <laughs> um, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who was born uh, of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and died and rose on the third day from the dead and ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead? better. <laughs> Do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the flesh? Ah, we've come a long way of the amount of things you have to believe from. Do you believe Jesus is Lord? <laughs> okay. So after we go through all of that that you're making statements of, then I would say um, do you believe in the canon? The not the boom canon. It means it's the, the books that go into the Bible. Do you believe in the canon as we have now defined it? All the books of the Bible. Do you believe that the bishops are the ones who have the power to tell you where you're supposed to go serve your appointment next to get your next check? <laughs> okay. okay. We, it, there really was now an affirmation about the episcopacy, the bishops, the pope, you believe the authority of them. Wow! In that short period of time, the creed has grown from, do you believe Jesus is Lord? To all that I just went through to ask. Each one of those things were put in there because of heresy. Because some, there was something that they were speaking against. Try to, ah, uh, you can't just go Jesus is Lord. Now we've got to explain it more and more and more. Do you believe in the Bible as we've defined it? Do you believe in the power of the bishops? It became more and more as we had to start trying to define what do we believe. Because in the early church, we had so many different sects that were all starting to come about. Between 160 and 190, by 200, we finally had really kind of begun to gain control to say, here's some basic beliefs. And we now were going to be a universal church. And what's another name for universal? Catholic. And where was the head of this new universal church? Rome. So now we have the holy, it's Jesus church. We got holy Roman Catholic universal church. So 
So it doesn't, you don't start with talking about the church as we know it. Yes, the Catholic Church would say we'll go all the way back to St. Peter. We begin, yes, but the structure, the real beginning, is closer to 160, 190 by 200. We have more of the structure in the church. So, we're going to start learning a little more about Rome, and Josh is going to talk about Rome some tonight, and what it was like in the earliest days of the church is coming into being, and I want you to make sure you're able to understand Constantine and some of these kinds of things that happen with Christianity and the world in which it evolves. So, that's what we're going to start trying to learn as we go along. And that's the idea. I want it to be a spiritual pilgrimage where you and I are growing in our faith, and when you come back, I expect you to be smarter than you've ever been before, <laughs> and you can explain your church history to anyone who would ask. So, tonight, we have a wonderful dinner, and we're going to have chicken parmesan on them and one tray and uh, my German accent is so good. We're going to have dumplings and sausage. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we have our Italian and we have our German. Sorry, Paul, I hate to tell you this. You don't get this good food tonight. Unless we box it up and ship it to you. I don't know. Yeah, see, he's seeing me. I'm watching him in the kitchen cooking his fish down in Costa Rica here. So, uh, we got you some Italian, we got you some German. We have your vegetables because my mother wouldn't have been happy had we not. Um, some wonderful salads, and one is very Italian salad. Caprese. Um, what is it? Caprese salad. Caprese salad. And we got your mozzarella and your tomatoes, and it's going to be great. We got you some garlic bread. And so then with the desserts, we have everything from tiramisu. Uh, then we got your black forest cake, which I'm German. And then just some fancy chocolate cake. For me? For right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bob. I'm a chocolate hole. I got it. Um, so we have great desserts. But what I'm asking you is don't get your dessert when you go to the line. You may get your salad, you may get your meal, and we're going to eat together, and I really want you to have the opportunity to get to know the people at your table. Tonight is about getting to know one another. And so then when we're done with that, then we're going to invite you to go back to get dessert, and I'm going to ask you to move to a different table just for dessert. Okay, so whoever you're getting to see and know right now, that's great, but I'm going to not only ask him, but of course, you to go sit somewhere else and get, get to know somebody else uh, on the second portion of the meal, and then we'll have a little presentation about the early church. So that's part of our agenda. Cool thing is also, out here we have a video booth. You may have seen it as you were coming up, and Brent was going to be there to help you with it. We found that was one of the challenges people sometimes had. Um, we have our video booth out here, and we invite you to go by and Take a minute, whatever you would like, to sit down and say, why am I going on this trip? What do I hope to get out of the trip? And when we have our reunion parties, which we will have, we will all get back together after we come back from this wonderful trip, we might see, what did you hope to get out of it? And you go, I didn't get that at all, Bob. <laughs> yeah. um, no, we will kind of have fun going, what did we experience? So, hope you'll go by the video booth, and take a moment. You don't have to tonight. We'll have another two or three of these. You can have your time to shoot if you need to work on your script so you're eloquent. You can do that. Uh, but if it really doesn't require that, we just want you to have some fun. Because that's going to be the whole thing. We're going to have fun as we go on this trip. So, any other just, uh, instructions I need to give for this back here for the dinner? No, I think we're good. He's got more in the kitchen, and I'm going to bring him out in a little bit and let us express our appreciation that right. we've got our international fair. Yes. So, yes, please don't go light because you think, oh, they don't have enough of this big crowd. we got plenty more in the kitchen. Okay, so get what you would like and we'll keep bringing it on and out. Like feeding the 5,000, we got it down. <laughs> the only thing we don't have is the water into wine. We're working on that. So, uh, anyway, go by and get whatever you like back here and uh, we'll keep bringing it out. Let's bow for a word. Oh God, we're so very grateful for tonight when we can come together and get to know new friends as we 
Also enjoy old friends and as we dream about dreams yet to come. We want to follow you and to have this as a wonderful time of growing in our faith and deepening our relationship with you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and our minds that truly we might prepare ourselves for the wonderful journey that you will lead us on. Thank you for this food. We know that we are indeed blessed that not everyone tonight will be able to be in such a wonderful way and share such a wonderful fellowship in a, such a beautiful place. We are indeed grateful, but we also ask that you strengthen us so we can go out into the world for those who are not so fortunate. And we seek to share your love and bring hope in your world. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Kathy, why don't you leave us all? Thank you all. They came for the food. They came for the food. <laughs> I hope it didn't disappoint. Yeah, it was a trip. Good, good. We're glad that you all came. They're going to be joining us with the trip as well, but thank you all for making the drive to be here with us this evening. Uh, also, today is a very special day, not only because we get to enjoy great food, but today is the 16th birthday of one Eric Manning. Eric is back here in the back. She chose to, she chose to spend her 16th birthday with us having dinner here tonight. So happy birthday, Erica. We ordered the birthday cake just for you. It is your treat tonight. I've asked Brittany if she would come and lead us in singing happy birthday because you'd much rather hear her sing than me. We'll sing it together. Happy birthday. begin to get to know names and faces and learn about one another as we're preparing for the trip. If you didn't have a chance to submit your photo yet and you would like to, uh, you can get with Brent Manning. Brent is back here in the back. You can get with him right after we're done tonight. And he'd be glad to go ahead and just take your picture here. Um, or if you want to send one to him or to us later on, you're welcome to, to do that also. But that'll be just fun for us to be able to have as we learn each other's names and faces uh, getting ready for this trip. Well, as Bob mentioned uh, earlier, you know, our hope with this trip is one, that you would get to know new people and get to make new friends along this trip. It's always a big part of these trips is the friendships that are formed on it. Uh, certainly, we will get to go and see lots of amazing places. Uh, we'll get to experience incredible things. Uh, but our hope truly is that this really is a spiritual pilgrimage. And all the way from now to the trip uh, is really part of the experience. And all during this time, we're going to be sharing different things that will help us to get the most out of this trip. So as we go to see these amazing places, maybe we'll know some of the stories behind it. We can learn a little bit more of the history and the theology of what was going on and the questions of faith that people were wrestling with. And all of it will help us as we are growing in our own faith on this spiritual pilgrimage. So tonight, since this is our first meeting together, we wanted to start at the beginning of our trip, which, as Bob mentioned, is the reason we did it that way is because it's really the beginnings of the Christian church. Now, of course, the, the Christian church goes all the way back to Jerusalem, uh, and there uh, in the, the eastern part, but really Rome would become the central part of the Christian church for many, many centuries. There's several reasons for that, and we want to talk about some of that tonight. When we get to Rome, we'll hear some of these stories. Uh, but the city of Rome was founded originally by two brothers, or as the story goes, uh, there were two brothers, Romulus and Remus. And uh, they started, they found this place amongst seven hills, and they decided it would be a good place to build a new city. And so they started to build the city. Well, the two brothers got into a fight about who was going to be in control. And so it was Romulus who killed his brother Remus, and so he named the city after himself. Romulus, that's where the name Rome comes from. That's the story, at least it's told. Uh, so this was founded back in around 730, 736 B.C. So for several hundred years, it would be ruled by kings, and then eventually it would become a republic. Uh, and we know many of the stories of the senators, of Julius Caesar, and eventually it would be uh, the emperors that would uh, expand the Roman Empire. 
Now, when all this was going on, this was about the same time that Christianity was starting, when the Roman Empire was really spreading. That was the time that Jesus came and lived, and ultimately died, was resurrected, and then the early church would start from there. Now, I'm curious, just by a show of hands, can anybody tell me who founded the church in Rome? Peter. 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 Anybody else know the answer? Paul. Paul. Paul? It's a trick question. I'm glad you knew that, Bob. <laughs> it is a trick question. We actually don't know who founded the church in Rome. A lot of people do attribute it to Peter because Peter was the first bishop of Rome. Uh, we certainly know that he spent time in Rome. Um, but we don't think that he was actually the one who founded it. We think it had actually already gotten to Rome before Peter got there. Others think Paul, there's good reason for that as well, we have the letter to the Romans from Paul. Every other letter that, that Paul wrote in the Bible was to a church that he started. So you get this letter to the Romans, it's usually a good assumption that he started whatever church he was writing to, but again in this case we know that Paul had not gotten to Rome yet, he didn't start the church there, he was looking for their help with some different things and trying to settle some disputes that they had going on. So it wasn't Peter. It wasn't Paul. We really don't know who started the church in Rome. It's one of the fascinating things about the history there is it was one of those saints of the church whose name has been lost to history and yet made this truly significant impact that has lasted for 2,000 years now and we get to experience the benefits of that. Somebody who simply did what God was calling them to do, not because of the recognition that they got from it, not because their name went down in history, but because it was what God wanted them to do. So they went and did it. So it is kind of fascinating, but we don't know who brought it to Rome, but eventually it did get there. The church in Rome would get started. And then it was uh, in around the year 60 to 64, there was an emperor. His name was Nero. Emperor Nero. Uh, he was a, a very powerful emperor in the Roman Empire. Uh, would help to spread the Roman Empire in several different ways. But he was also known as somebody who was not very kind. Uh, he was uh, to anybody. It wasn't just the Christians, it was really anybody that got in his way of doing whatever it was that he wanted to do. He was going to trample over them to make sure that he did whatever he wanted. The story is that Nero decided he wanted to build a new palace. He had this dream of this beautiful summer home there in Rome and had this new palace there where he could live. And he had a perfect spot picked out for it. The only problem was there were already some homes that were built there. So how do you get rid of all of these homes? There was no public domain back then. You couldn't just claim land. One night, supposedly, a, a fire broke out in this area. The story is, is that Nero was uh, off in the distance watching the fire consume this part of Rome, playing his fiddle, playing the violin, watching Rome burn. Now, sure enough, as soon as it burned, all these houses were gone. He came in and claimed it as his own. He built his palace there. So, of course, people started turning to him and saying, well, this, this looks a little bit fishy. We know you wanted to build there. And now, all of a sudden, this fire breaks out. Now, you built your house there. So, he needed a scapegoat. Well, the easy one at that time were the new kids in town, and that was the Christians. And so, Nero blamed the fire on the Christians, and he would go on to persecute them heavily, saying that it was their fault that this fire broke out and destroyed all of these homes. He persecuted the Christians very heavily. Uh, and eventually, uh, he actually kicked out some of the Christians out of the city of Rome. Uh, but it was a very difficult time. And yet, even in the midst of all that persecution, the church continued to grow and was stronger than ever before, even after Nero had finished his time as emperor. So this is really how the Christian church got started in Rome. It was from very humble beginnings. We don't even know who founded it. It was in the midst of persecution and turmoil. And people were going and doing what God was calling them to do. Peter would eventually get there, uh, and he would be named the first bishop of Rome. So today we hear of the Pope. Well, the Pope is the bishop of Rome. So Peter would be the first Pope, the first bishop of Rome. So he was really the one who kind of was given the, the symbolic um, head of the church uh, there in Rome, although he wasn't the one that founded it. Over time, uh, these bishops would continue to go on. Uh, and now in Rome at this time, even after Nero was done with this time as emperor, the emperors were still not always too fond of the Christians, but they kind of allowed them to exist there. It was technically illegal. You know, Rome at that time was pagan, 
So they had their gods and goddesses that they worshipped, but they allowed the Christians to really just kind of exist and do their thing. It was in the year 300, uh, 309 uh, that, that there was an emperor named Constantine, one of the most significant emperors in the Roman Empire for the Christian faith. Throughout the year 309, that Constantine was going into battle one day. This was going to be a major battle to decide the fate of the future of the Roman Empire. Who was going to be in control? If he won this battle, he knew that he had control of the Roman Empire. Well, the story is that the night before he went into battle, he had this vision, this dream from God. And God told him, if you place this divine symbol on the shields of your soldiers, then you'll win the battle. And he saw this vision of what this symbol was, and so he went out. They put it on all their flags, they put it on their shields, they put it on all of their stuff before they went into battle. The symbol is what we call a key row. It's the Greek letters, key and row. What we think of today is X and key. Brent, do we have that? The key row symbol uh, was the symbol that Constantine saw, and then when he got out there on the battlefield, the story is that he actually saw this up in the sky, and he knew that this was a sign from God that he was going to win the battle. The reason that they chose this, the key row, is it's the first two letters of the, the word Christus, or Christos, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. So it was considered the divine symbol. So this is what Constantine went to battle under this flag, the key row symbol. When he won the battle, he decided, I'm going to give glory to God for winning this battle. And he would always tell the Christians, your God is the reason that I won the battle. Your God is the reason that I'm the emperor of Rome. And so he was very supportive of the Christian church, gave a lot of money to the Christian church, allowed them to exist, and actually made the Christ uh, Christianity legal in the Roman Empire for the very first time. It had been 300 years. They had lived under persecution, under so much turmoil, and finally, Christianity was legal in Rome uh, because of Constantine. Now, many people think that Constantine was the one uh, who actually made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That actually wouldn't come until a few years later, when it was um, a couple of emperors later, Theodosius. Theodosius was the one that came along and he said, okay, now we've got all these Christians and it's legal here, but we want to make this the official religion of the Roman Empire. He was baptized by the Bishop of Rome at that time, and then he decided we're going to issue an edict, because right now you've got all of these different sects that are out there that Bob was talking about a minute ago, who believe all of these different things. What do we mean when we say that Jesus is Lord? What do we believe about the bishops? And what about this over here? What about that over there? So you had all of these different groups that were going on out there. So Theodosius came along and said, we're going to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And we're going to outline what it means to be a Christian. And it was in the year three, uh, 313, or excuse me, 380, the year 380, that Theodosius had the Edict of Thessalonica. Now, this is really great. This is important for us. Because at the Edict of Thessalonica, Theodosius came and he said, we're going to settle all the controversies in the church forever. There will never be controversy in the church again. Isn't it nice to know? We've got nothing to worry about. We've got the Edict of Thessalonica. Theodosius sorted it all out for us. Now, he issued this, and it would, uh, it would make Christianity legal. For 1,700 years now, we've all lived in peace, and harmony, no controversies. <laughs> At the same time, you started to see a little bit of a divide between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. You see, Constantine had really kind of moved his main city to Constantinople uh, over in the East, but then you still had Rome in the West. And so the Christian Church kind of started to follow the same pattern, where you had those who were sort of in power over in the Eastern part, and then you had the Bishop of Rome and all of those in the Western part, and for the most part, they got along with each other. They maybe had different ideas about how to operate the church, how to run the church, but they really got along for the most part. But it was later on in the year 1054, so speed ahead about 700 years, the year 1054, finally they decided they could no longer get along, and there was what they called the Great Schism, the Great Split, uh, between the East and the West. Now, at that time, you would have the Eastern Orthodox Church. Orthodox means right beliefs. And then you would have the Roman Catholic Church. And Catholic means what? Universal. Universal. So you had the Orthodox, those who said, well, we have the right beliefs. We believe the right things. And over on the West, they were saying, well, we are the Universal Church. 
So what, they had this argument going on. Really what it came down to is, was in the creeds. One of the creeds it said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. In the West, some of them started adding on this little line that said, and the Son. And the Eastern Church said, well, who are you to decide that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son? We weren't consulted on this. And so it turned into this whole argument. We split the church over whether did the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son or just from the Father. You can see that the Edict of Thessalonica really worked well. <laughs> it would continue to go on. And then, uh, and then here in the 1300s, the church would continue to fracture again. And by this time, you had uh, France was becoming its own kingdom. And you had Britain starting to emerge. Uh, all of these other kings that were starting to pop up. And political power was no longer as centralized in Rome as it had once been. So you had a king, uh, King Charles, uh, was in power up in, in France at the time. So he decided, well, why does Rome get to have all the power of the church? Why does the Pope have to be in Rome? And so he went to some of the cardinals who were French, and he staged them together, and he used his political power to say, we're going to elect a French Pope, and we're going to move them to France. And so that's exactly what they did. It was in 1394 uh, that they would elect a French Pope, and they would move them to Avignon, there in France. It was the first time in over 1,300 years that the Pope did not reside in Rome. They moved him out to Avignon. They were there. Uh, Pope Gregory XI was the one uh, who tried to move the papacy back to Rome after about 60 years. One moved back to Rome, but the politics started to get messy, as it sometimes can. Fortunately, the Edict of Thessalonica was not working anymore. <laughs> So the politics started to get messy. Pope Gregory XI wanted to move back to Rome. He did move back to Rome as the Pope. But then the French Cardinal said, well, fine, we'll elect our own Pope over here in Avignon. And so they did. And so there was a period of about 60 years in there where you had a Pope in Rome, and then you had what we would call the anti-Pope over in Avignon. Both of them claimed that they were the real Pope. Everybody debated about which one was correct. This would go on for about 60 years. Several different lines of popes would come through there, one in Rome, one in Avignon. Finally, they were able to get it sorted out, the ones in Avignon sort of faded away. Before they did, though, there was actually a third one that emerged for just a few years. You had three popes all at one time, each claiming that they were the real pope. Kind of a fascinating time in history. Outside of that time, Rome has always been the center the Roman church. That's where the Pope has always resided, outside of that whole period where it went to Avignon. So, this was all going along, uh, but then we remembered that we had the Edict of Thessalonica, so we came back together and we got all the controversies, and life was good again. Rome today, yeah, somebody caught that. It's not always so good. Rome today, uh, we know that whenever we go there on our trip, we will get to see the city of Rome, but we will also go to the Vatican. The Vatican, of course, is where the Pope resides today. That is the capital of sort of the, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, it is its own independent nation. It is the smallest nation in the world, about 109 acres. That's how big it is, 109 acres. Uh, it's about two miles to walk around it. Uh, it is one-eighth the size of Central Park in New York City. One-eighth the size of Central Park in New York City. It's the smallest country in the world. The, uh, the, the Vatican City was not established as its own independent nation until 1929. There was some controversy that had gone along back in the 1800s uh, when Italy started to form its own kind of uh, collected state or nation. And so there were all these little papal states that had been out there, and Italy kind of came and swept it all up and said, you're now part of Italy. And so the Pope at that time was really resistant to that, really resented that they had done that. And so they held on to the Vatican, Vatican Hill, he said, we're not letting you take this. Well, it was finally in 1929 that came and settled this dispute. Uh, it had gone on for 60 years, and the Italian government agreed to say, you will have your own independent nation. Uh, this will be the Vatican City. Uh, this is your place. We will not take it. So it's been that way for uh, 90 years now. Uh, the Vatican has been its own place. So we'll get to go and see that and uh, get to be in all these different places. But it's just a little bit of the history of Rome there. Uh, we're going to go and... Uh, and get to view the amazing port that's in the Vatican City, uh, the Sistine Chapel. We will get to see Michelangelo's paintings on the ceiling, the Sistine Chapel. Uh, whenever you walk through the museums there, there's incredible.
incredible artwork. When we get there, we'll get to go to St. Peter's Basilica, which was built on top of the, uh, the grave of St. Peter. Uh, he was eventually martyred there under Emperor Nero in Rome. And so they would come back later and build St. Peter's Basilica. And so his remains are still down in there, as well as many, many other saints of the church are buried there underneath St. Peter's Basilica. So we're going to get to see all of this whenever we go to Rome. And what an amazing, amazing history it has. I'm really looking forward to this trip and getting to spend time with all of you. We're going to have more of these meetings uh, in the future, and we'll certainly let you all know about those dates as they get closer. And we'll be sending those out by email, just like we did for this one. So if you have a different email address that you would like for us to use to keep in touch with you about things, please let me know that. I know some of you have already reached out, so we've got that adjusted. If anybody else would like us to use a different email, you can let me know that time. We'll let you know about future meetings. We'll also be sending out information and just fun things along the way to help prepare us for the trip so that we really can get the most out of it. I'm going to invite Marsha to come up and uh, close this out this evening. Um, remember at the end, if you have a chance, go by the, uh, the video booth, tell your story, tell us what you're excited about this trip, what you're hoping to get out of it. Uh, go by and see Brent if you want your picture taken, and uh, we'd love to get that from you. And, uh, we're just glad to have you here tonight.
83 new friends, <laughs> which really is the goal. I'm going to offer a word of prayer. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. Share with one another. Go by the video booth. Uh, we'll be having several more opportunities. And put more cake out. Okay. <laughs> he brought more cake out. All right. Yeah, I told you. There would always be more and more. So we do have a little more cake. If there was something you didn't get to taste, it is out there now. Josh, in the moment after the prayer, would you mind standing at Matt's still out there? We'd like to thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh God, we are so very grateful that we should have such a wonderful opportunity before us. We do seek to grow ever closer to you. We seek to grow ever closer to one another. And most of all, God, we pray that by deepening our relationship with you and one another, our eyes might be open to how we can truly see others in this world in a different way. So prepare our hearts that we might be ready to receive all that you want to offer to us so that we can truly be your hands, sharing your love and bringing hope in your world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And Matt? He's gone. He's gone. Right. He's gone. Right. You know, we'll bring him back next time. We'll let him cook another meal so we can thank him again. Thank you for coming.